Welcome to the Right Handyman How-To Series. In these videos, I will show you some tips and tricks to help you avoid those mistakes that can turn a small project into a large disaster. I'll be your host, Colin, the Right Handyman. Today's project, we're actually going to be putting a wall down the middle of this bedroom to divide it into two, obviously. Now the windows, there's one for each room, which is great. Obviously, there's only one door, so I'm gonna have to add a door just to the left of that one. Probably move a couple of electrical switches. So this ought to be fun. After carefully laying out the plans for the room and taking into account where the windows are and where the doors have to be, I've marked out where this wall is going to go. So the first step is, let's scrape off the ceiling so that we have something nice and solid to attach these studs to. Once you have the ceiling scraped, the next step is to cut the carpet, get it out of the way to make room for the base plate. Now what we want to do here is we just want to split the carpet down the middle and roll it out of the way so that when the wall is done, we can trim the carpet to size and reinstall it with a nice edge. A piece of string is one of your best friends here to cut a nice straight line. Alright, so we've peeled back the uh, carpet in the middle of the floor here. And we're just trying to locate the studs. So the studs are obviously going to be on the one side of that light switch. I have not marked them out on the ceiling yet, but as you can see I have scraped down the whole ceiling. Not the whole ceiling, but the part where I'm going to be putting the wall. Now what concerns me is over here, right where I want to put this uh, wall, there's a stud just to the left of it, there's going to be one just to the right, but there's something really wide showing up on the stud finder right where I want to put this. So I may drill a little hole in the wall here and uh, have a look because I don't know what that is and I don't want to drill into it if it's something extremely important, obviously. Good times. After finding the locations of the joists and the ceiling and attaching a 2x4 to it, it's now time to determine where the base plate's going to go. To do this, I've attached a plumb bob to the one side of the 2x4 and let it hang down and then put marks on the floor where the base plate is going to end up. When building a wall, always try and make sure that you get the bow going in the same direction for all of your studs. This way your wall will look smooth and won't have an undulating effect to it. With the top and bottom plates installed, it's now time to put in the studs. I'm going to be placing these 16 inches on center. Starting from one wall, I put marks on the top and bottom plates for where all the studs are supposed to go. After installation, I always like to double check with the level, just to be sure. Alright, so you'll notice here that I've uh, had to put more than one 2x4 down to make it the length of this room. So I put the one joint here, and I put the other joint down here. Now the reason for that is I don't want those joints in the same place because they may act like a hinge even though these things are all screwed to studs and that, but it just gives you a little stronger wall. Alright, so I've marked out where I want to put the wall and the door and everything on this one wall and I've used my stud finder to locate a few things. You can see I've got my rough opening from there over to here. This light switch is going to have to be on the new wall, sort of just inside this door. And uh, I cut a couple exploratory holes in here. Small things that can be easily patched, just in case there's something in the way. Um, looking into this hole, the wiring here goes straight up, and uh, there should be enough wiring that I can get it over onto the wall without any major operation, so that's good. This light switch is going to have to move over to the left here a bit, and uh, which isn't a big deal. Now I know there's a stud right in the middle of where my door is going to go, but this one here is uh, a double stud. 
and that makes me wonder why has it been doubled up. Um, I don't know if this is a load-bearing wall. If it is, I'll just have to, uh, you know, frame in the door accordingly. But uh, that one's doubled up. This one's a single. And then I know there's quite a bit of uh, lumber over here. So this may be a load-bearing wall. It is kind of running down about a third of the house. So I'll have to be very careful. I'm just going to peel the drywall off. And uh, we'll see what we get behind it here. So this ought to be fun. With the rough opening for the door laid out and a plan for where all the electrical was going to go, it was now time to cut a door into this wall. Now that I have the drywall off, I found something very interesting behind this wall. Okay, so when I cut my uh, exploratory holes in the wall here, I ran into this double stud, so I wasn't sure if this wall was uh, load-bearing or uh, what was going on. Now that I've cut through it, there's only a single plate at the bottom, which is one indication that it's probably not load-bearing, but mind you, that is not uh, a foolproof method. However, what I discovered as I looked in the wall here is, uh, looks like there's a header up there. I do believe the spot I have opened up here was where the original door in this room was supposed to be. This is an oversized bedroom, so I'm guessing the door used to be virtually where I uh, wanted to put it here, but they moved it over to there for whatever reason. I guess probably aesthetics, just because it's up against the linen closet maybe. So. Unfortunately, I can't actually use the old door frame because it's going to be too close to where my new wall is going to go. But uh, a lot of the parts are already there. I can, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to pull that header out of there. So not a uh, impossible problem, but uh, just a pain in the butt one. So. Moving this other switch was a little more tricky as I had to feed the cable through a wall and around a corner and through a wall, but I managed to get it done. So as now it's in place, we're all ready to go. All right, so I finally got this door framed in. And uh, what I was trying to do here was minimize the amount of drywall work I was gonna have to do. So I was able to, uh, you know, slip the King and Jack studs in there and get them attached without cutting the drywall back on either side. Unfortunately, where I pointed out to you before, there was a previous door framed in there that was just drywalled over, and because of that, among other reasons, I actually had to cut the drywall a little bit up on this side just to get the uh, header in there. That was not a low bearing wall. But I did put a double header in there just because I like to overbuild things. When you look at the other side here, You'll see all I gotta do is put the door in and the trim on. The drywall's already there and finished. I don't have to mess with it. Now one of the uh, interesting parts of this project is the cold air return. So this used to be one big room. There is uh, heat vents under each window and there'll be one window in each room. The cold air return is actually behind that dresser over there, which the dresser's just there temporarily. So there's only gonna be one cold air return. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a cold air return in between these two uh, uh, studs here. Now the other problem is I have to insulate this this room uh, just for sound. So what I'm going to end up having to do is I'm going to have to build some baffles in there to prevent sound from just blasting through the old vent there because it would kind of defeat the purpose to insulate the wall for soundproofing and then just have the sound go straight through your uh, cold air return here. All right, so I've got the vapor barrier hung up. Now, being an internal wall, you don't need a vapor barrier. This is basically to prevent 
air movement from hot to cold or cold to hot, such as an exterior wall. This is interiors between two bedrooms. That shouldn't be an issue. However, what I'm going to be doing is I will be insulating this wall and I want to use this plastic as a way to keep the insulation fibers at a minimum because it is, um, it's a kid's room. They do sleep in here at night. I'm trying to keep it as clean as possible. So what I've done is I've just hooked it up along the top and basically I can tuck the insulation in there and staple it along as I go and I'm hoping that's going to work to keep things to a minimum. So you can see what I'm doing here. I'm just uh, using the vapor barrier sort of as a giant drop sheet and I'm working underneath of it to protect the rest of the room while I get the insulation in the walls here. I'm hoping that'll keep any uh, of this insulation where it should be and not all over the place. Now that all the insulation's in and the vapor barrier is attached, it's time to put on some drywall. I always like to start at the top, that way you've got nice factory lines butting up against the ceiling. And of course, when you cut the bottom part, you can put the car cut part down and hide it with the trim when you're finished. Now I am by no means an expert at finishing drywall. People that can do this quickly and really well are worth the money you pay you. I can however make it look pretty good. One of the key things you want to do is you don't want to use the pre-mixed stuff when you're doing your mudding and taping. That's for just the final coat. It is too soft. What you want to do is get about a 45 minute or a 90 minute setting compound and when this stuff sets it's going to be like concrete. That's for your first two layers of mud. You can use the pre-mix stuff for your final coat because it doesn't have any sand in it. It'll be easy to finish with, it'll be easy to sand smooth, and it'll give you a nice smooth finish. All right, so after a whole bunch of uh, effort, I got the drywall all finished here and I got the coat of primer on. So now all I gotta do is get the carpet back into place, cut it to size, paint the walls, and do this knockdown ceiling. And a little bit of trim and stuff like that we're all done okay so it's time to put the carpet back in here so what i've had to do is i've had to add these uh basically nail strips and you want to make sure that the points are kind of pointing away from your carpet because what will happen is the carpet goes over top and catches on these and holds it into place now you want to put it about say an inch from the wall and then what i'm going to have to do here is obviously i got to cut this underlay to fit inside the nail strip and then the carpet will actually sit right over top of it. So when you're cutting your carpet what you want to do is you want to have it just a little bit long because once you put it in there you're just going to kind of tuck it under the wall and then that way of course your trim sits over top should give you a nice uh, a nice clean finish with it. So let's get the knee kicker and get this thing installed. So oh, carpet's back in. All I gotta do now is paint some trim and get that installed and a few other things. Before we get to painting, we wanna do the knockdown ceiling. What you wanna do is just use finishing drywall compound and a sponge and basically sponge it onto the ceiling. Let it sit for about five minutes and then you get one of these big bladed knives and run over it once. Now you wanna be careful that you don't put extra mud on the existing knockdown ceiling. What will happen is that mud fills in the voids and it makes it look very terrible. So you want to be very precise about where you put this. <laughs> 